Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today from wherever in the world you are. My name is Sarah Jane Demi, and I am the founder and CEO of Demi Colton, located here in New York City. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the ninth installment of the Demi Colton Virtual Salon Series, which will be a fireside chat with Dr. Amy Abernathy, Principal Deputy Commissioner of Food and Drugs at the FDA, led by Art Pappas of Pappas Capital. Demi Colton's mission is all about convening biopharma and digital medicine industry leaders to catalyze change. We know we help drive innovation when we bring individuals together who are united by a common cause and a shared passion. And in our industry, that cause and passion is bringing therapeutics and cures to people in need. We were in the process of launching our new international business development and investor conference, BioFuture, here in New York City when COVID-19 changed everything about what we all do. In lieu of our in-person BioFuture meeting, we launched the Demi Colton Virtual Salon Series to continue our mission of bringing people together with great content. I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank each and every one of our sponsors who have encouraged us and supported us during this very challenging time. At Demi Colton, we have come to believe that the virtual salon series will be here to stay, even after we get beyond COVID and get back to whatever the new normal will be. We've learned that it's a great medium that allows us to bring you great content on an ongoing basis and I encourage you to please check our website for future salons, fireside chats, topics, and speakers. It is evolving constantly, and we always welcome suggestions of both topics and speakers. I encourage you to join us at future events. A word about today's structure uh, of today's salon. The formal portion of the fireside chat will last between 50 and 55 minutes. It will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A period. You can submit questions in the ask a question pane at the, uh, below the screen, and we will address as many as possible. We do appreciate succinct wording in your questions, uh, so please bear that in mind. Also, please note that this salon will be recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing later today. Now to, to, to today's virtual salon. The topic is the fusion of technology, technologies. The lines are blurring between physical, digital, and biological sciences. I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Um, um, the first is, doc, uh, is Art Pappas. Art is the found, founder and managing partner of Pappas Capital. Art has over 40 years of experience as a venture capital investor in life sciences and pharmaceutical executive. Art founded Pappas Capital in 1994, and over the past 25 years, the firm has managed more than 540 million in capital and invested in more than 85 biotech companies. Art currently serves and has served as a director, board observer, and chairman for multiple companies. Prior to founding Pappas Capital, Art held senior leadership positions at Glaxo Holdings, Abbott International, Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, and the Dow Chemical Company. Dr. Amy Abernathy is the Principal Deputy Commissioner of Food and Drugs for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In her role, Amy helps oversee the agency's day-to-day -day functioning and directs special and high-priority initiatives that cut across offices overseeing FDA's regulation of drugs, medical devices, tobacco, and food. As acting chief information officer, she oversees FDA's data and technical vision and its execution. Amy, by background, is a hematologist, oncologist, and palliative medicine physician, and is an internationally recognized clinical data expert and clinical researcher. Her areas of expertise include can cancer data, real-world evidence, clinical trials, health services research, patient-reported outcomes, clinical informatics, and patient-centered care. 
Before coming to FDA, Dr. Abernathy served as chief medical officer, chief scientific officer, and senior vice president for oncology at Flatiron Health, which is now a part of the Roche Group. Prior to Flatiron, Dr. Abernathy was professor of medicine at Duke University School of Medicine, where she ran the Center for Learning Healthcare in, Duke, uh, in the Duke Clinical Research Institute and the Duke Cancer Care Research Program in the Duke Cancer Institute. Uh, thank you both for being here with us today. And now I'm really pleased to turn the virtual podium over to Art. Art? All right, the thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey, Sarah, thank you for the kind introduction and importantly for establishing the BioFutures platform in these virtual salon discussions. They've been highly productive with great topics and timely in this virtual world, so thank you. Amy, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you and thank you for participating. You know, as I was preparing my comments, Amy, I thought back to the first time we met. I don't know if you remember, but it was over dinner at the home of a mutual friend. You were at Duke and had your lab and clinical practice. And I vividly recall our conversation, which was about entrepreneurship, clinical outcomes, and of all things, patents. Um, a dinner conversation that only got better with wine. <laughs> but since then, your career progress, as uh, Sarah highlighted, is downright impressive. Your move to Flatiron and what you did there to help patients and physicians and then on to the FDA to take control of its modernization efforts has been spectacular. Importantly, these past few months have been unprecedented across many fronts and you've been right in the middle of it all. What a period and what an impact. Amy, take, take a minute and just tell us a bit about how you and your team have managed these uh, past few months on a personal basis. Art, first of all, it's an honor to be here with you. And um, I remember that first moment very well. And uh, it's amazing to be here in October 2020 together, thinking about both where we've been in the future. Um, how are we doing? I, I think, you know, we're all human beings at the FDA, just like um, all of you in the audience. And, uh, you know, COVID-19 is indeed hard. We're working virtually. Um, we're, we've doubled our workload at FDA, and we're working hard on addressing the pandemic sitting right in front of us, as well as the critical workload to continue to be able to evaluate and approve safe and effective products. So, uh, you know, that is the work that's still ongoing. So how do we maintain that pace? Practically speaking, you know, first of all, I, I'm very proud of FDA's focus on mission. Um, and that's been really important in the context of the pandemic to recognize our core mission really in, in one of the central roles in trying to address the pandemic, including approval of therapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, the second thing that I would say is um, that uh, it's really important for us to step back and follow the path that we know how to follow well, including um, review of the science, attention to data, and also process. And, and really, we can't let that go, and, and we're very focused on that. That being said, we also have to figure out where can we be flexible? And that's been another part of how, as an agency, we've needed to be able to get comfortable with different ways of responding to the epidemic um, or pandemic. Um, the last thing I would like to say is that um, it's been important to also acknowledge that we're human. And so finding ways to maintain connectedness in this virtual world um, to make sure that we check in with each other and all the aspects that we need to do every day as humans has been really, really important to maintain the pace in what I now call a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> well, let me pick up on that uh, final point. I mean, with COVID, uh, the impact on the healthcare system and the way it's transformed, gosh, patient care, clinical programs, and supply chain dynamics is impressive. Uh, the FDA facing the pandemic demonstrated its proudness in providing proactive guidance to innovative drug development companies. In fact, you did it so quickly, it almost seemed like you had a contingency file plan in your, in your right drawer. <laughs> but mm -hmm. 
But the FDA also provided profound leadership and management to the country's vaccine uh, strategy. I mean, we have, I think, 44 vaccines in human clinical trials and none. And this is all this year. And we had none, if any, uh, uh, last year. Um, but what can we expect next? I mean, are these changes that have been put in place here to stay? And if so, can they be maintained? And I'm curious as to what are the key elements that you've learned that has allowed the FDA to move this quickly? So, so first of all, Art, um, we have recently embarked um, on a re sort of a, a, a mid pandemic review of what's been going on at the agency um, as a way of really making sure that the way that we are currently doing our work um, is as efficient and as effective as possible and, and what should persist in, in, in the future. So we're actually actively asking this question in, in a formal way, but you know, in, in a less formal um, way, I, I submit to you my observations um, today. So, so one thing that has um, been clear is the importance of regulatory flexibility in being ready to respond to the pandemic. Um, as you mentioned, it almost felt like some of the um, public health emergency guidances um, that uh, we have put out um, were sitting in the side drawer ready. Um, and certainly we've been continuously thinking about what might um, we need to accommodate in the context of a public health emergency. And, and so, you know, examples of regulatory flexibility that I, I think will really either persist or we'll learn a lot from them and we'll see um, new changes in the future. Um, one example is within the context of the clinical trial space. So remote patient evaluation um, using telemedicine and, and other solutions. It was something that we had been advising uh, that was a potential within the context of clinical trials pre-pandemic and certainly has become a requirement um, for many trials for patients who can't get to the doctor or the site of evaluation within the context of the pandemic. Another example is the use of rural data, which I think we'll probably come back to, and, and how do we use rural data within the context of clinical trials and also for longitudinal evaluation and monitoring. Um, another one is the delivery of an investigational product to um, the patient's home or somewhere near the patient so the person doesn't need to fly to, for example, in Houston in order to, to get the investigational product on the co in the context of clinical trial. E each of these will require us to step back and look carefully at um, how did each of these elements of regulatory flexibility perform and also um, what was the impact on patient safety as well as the integrity of the data set so we can understand which of these elements within the context of regulatory flexibility should persist and which ones um, really need to be pulled back. And I think you're going to see that in a lot of different areas related to regulatory flexibility. We've certainly learned a lot through the use of um, emergency use authorizations. The second thing that I think you're going to see persist post-pandemic is um, how we use data. You mentioned supply chain disruptions and um, issues around drug shortages a minute ago, Art. And we're now learning how to use data, really data that's uh, under the, the umbrella of the language of real world data to start answering all kinds of questions that now can be data informed as we make our decisions about how to do our work as an agency. And really practical example there is using real world data such as information from electronic health records and claims data sets to understand um, surge in drug demand as well as potential um, impact on drug, drug shortages or the supply chain. The third that I think that's quite different is collaboration, and we're seeing much more collaboration across FDA, across government, and then across all the different partners. And, and I think that kind of collaboration will persist. It'll be really interesting to see what all we've learned about working together and transparency post-COVID. Um, the, the fourth is prioritization. I think one of the things that COVID's teaching us is that if we're going to be efficient about um, developing vaccines, developing therapeutics, we need to prioritize the work and make sure that precious resources, not just money, but also patient time and allocation are prioritized to the highest impact or highest potential impact activities. And then the last is something that I'll be curious to see how it persists, and that's what I'm gonna call pace and urgency. 
Um, you know, as a cancer doctor, certainly there was always urgency in my work. Rare diseases, we've seen urgency. We see urgency in lots of areas across the agency, but there are other places where it take it might take a year or two years or three years to get something done. And that urgency really did not transcend all of the work. And it'll be interesting to see how do we maintain that pace and urgency um, across all of the kind of work we're doing in order to continuously improve in the future. Yeah. You know, you said a lot there about, uh, and in fact, the way I listened to and heard what you said, it's clearly, a, 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 as you look to the end point, it's really moving us more toward a value-based care for the patient and the overall healthcare system. And we've been trying to do that for a while. Certainly you have, and as you demonstrated at Flatiron, uh, that was a key mandate to try to use data to bring back uh, better outcomes. Um, COVID seems to have helped us leapfrog many of the hurdles that we were facing in trying to move toward a value-based care. Um, are your thoughts and impressions that this is a real leapfrog and these things will remain in a permanent way, or is it something that we're just going to have to watch how it plays out, as you pointed, as you just pointed out? But in addition, the other point you made, and I hadn't appreciated this till recently was how many of the agencies are involved in dealing with, just, just take the vaccine trials. I mean, the FDA is in the middle of it, but you've got DARPA, you've got DOD, you've got NIH, you've got so many groups working in, in parallel and in tandem to make this whole thing work. Um, but between the leapfrogging to the ultimate endpoint and then all this in between, uh, how do you see that kind of playing out and, this, and the synchronization of that playing out? Well, you know, I, I think that the story that you've just told is a story of coordination, right? In order to develop the vaccines, but also manufacture and distribute them in an equitable way, um, we really have to have massive coordination at a scale that is possible, but doesn't always happen. And so certainly, um, I think we've seen what that coordination can and should look like. We've also seen shortcomings that we need to solve, Art. So one of those shortcomings um, has certainly been in the context of data. And, and the, one of the things that um, uh, has often talked about is challenges we have with accessing the data that we need in order to ma manage a public health emergency. So, you know, everything from challenges data around within their healthcare systems by fax machine, still 2020, um, <laughs> to the uh, you know, challenge that we have that that we've known for time about our data sets not necessarily talking um, to each other or not necessarily having all the variables that we need to answer the questions within the context of the pandemic. And so I think one of the things that this coordination is teaching us is the importance of a coordinated information architecture. And I think that will be um, important to see persist in the future. And the reason I mentioned that is because you sort of started off um, the, this question, you know, highlighting a move towards value-based care and, you know, often a concept that we have talked about for a long time called learning healthcare systems, where the idea is the whole system of healthcare delivery is continuously learning, continuously moving towards more and more patient-centered personalized care, which is honed and chiseled and fine-tuned to be the right care for you, which ideally derives value, uh, improves value because it reduces waste and ensures that the care that you're receiving, the drug treatments, the healthcare delivery activities, et cetera, are really the ones that you fully need um, and also ensures most optimal outcomes. I always sort of think about the, the idea of a learning healthcare system is when the care of this person is informed by all people who've come before her who've got similar characteristics and then her care is reinvested in, in, into this overall system of the future. And, and I do think that lots of things that we've learned in the context of, of COVID are moving us down that path, although it, we still have a lot to, to do. One last comment as it relates to this. So, you know, as we think about moving towards value-based care, if we think um, moving in this direction towards building a learning healthcare system, one might argue Yes, but that's really a healthcare delivery aim. What's that got to do with FDA? Um, and certainly within the context of FDA, we're responsible for regulating the medical products or many of the medical products that um, are within the context 
of that leading edge of improving healthcare delivery. So that's one way that FDA is a key actor um, in that in that overall system. But a second right. way that the FDA is a key actor is that we are also the beacon of what good looks like with respect to high quality data that's going to move us in that direction, high quality analyses, and how do we do this work well? And so I think that FDA has a really continued role in showing what it looks like to move this system forward. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And let me let me kind of break that up in two parts. One, you know, I think this is a this is kind of where we're victims of our own success. But there's a possible dilemma that we may face and that there may be an increasing number of these new and innovative medicines coming forward. And this may, in fact, tax the FDA. A lot of us worry that it will. Mm -hmm. uh, and the resources as, a drug, as drug development sponsors seek approval of these innovative type of drugs. Uh, but let me leave that there for a second. Then go back to another point, <laughs> another point you made. Um, but, you know, developing a medicine, as you pointed out, has to be for the good of the patient. And a clinical trial must answer the question, is a drug safe and effective? And is it importantly doing something for the patient compared to not doing anything at all? So I took my lessons well from you and Rob Califf on that last point. <laughs> but it's always surprising to learn that we still allow many trials to go forward for some unimportant indications. And one never seems to get a really clear answer. Is the drug truly effective or safe or is it just marginally so? So as you look to the near future, are there trends in new drug development guidance coming forward? Are these trends requiring new predictive statistical models, which may help to define cost efficiencies and patient outcome value as part of an approval? And from the audience, we got a question, will CMC become part of the FDA? You can just tuck that in there a little bit. Become part of the FDA. And, and CMC in terms of manufacturing and controls or CMC maybe CMC something really else. Part of it, and then go to the other part of that and that's CMS, CMS doing the approval of the pricing. Got it. So, so, so let me kind of- Some of us believe CMC is going, the, the manufacturing element is going to be the new hurdle within moving forward our trials or at least collaborating with pharma. In the past, it wasn't as critical as it is today. Today, it's the new kind of hurdle. CM, CMS has always been a hurdle, but if, you're, if you really believe in patient outcome value as part of an approval, how close should be that to the approval the FDA gives to a new drug? Yes, okay. So, uh, you know what? I'm gonna break this question up into some topic areas just to make sure that, that um, what I say is coherent. Um, so first, as you pointed out, there, there's going to be um, a, a number of needed uh, areas of progress that are going to help us be more efficient in, in drug development and also do the trials that need to be done. Um, and um, I, I think that there's a couple of you know, examples right now that are data and mathematically motivated that will help us continue um, down uh, this path. Um, one uh, certain trend, certainly one trend that I think is going to continue to be very important in this space is going to be that around totality of the evidence. We would love to have a phase three clinical trial. And I, when I say we, I think it's the global we across healthcare for every single question that needs to be addressed, of course. But the ability to have phase three clinical trials for every question, the, whether it is because they, th those trials cannot be accomplished because of um, this is a rare disease or there are patients who are otherwise uh, um, not eligible for the traditional phase threes and therefore are excluded from trials and we don't have information about them. The need to be able to have a combination of rural data and clinical trials information, I think is really a direction that is going to persist but the big task there is going to be to continue to figure out how. How do we look towards totality of the evidence to, to, to really continue to move us down the path? And I, I can come back to that one um, if you'd like to talk more about the topic. Second thing is, um, you know, areas such as model-informed drug development, which is a pilot going on um, in, in CEDAR right now. And the idea is really, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to have 
um, to build through both preclinical and clinical data, exposure-based biological and statistical models that help to refine clinical trial design, that potentially um, reduce um, or improve the chance of regulatory success, potentially help optimize dose selection and, and other aspects um, related to the therapeutic. And, and this particular pilot um, is actively ongoing and I think you know signals the way in terms of how simulation can help us um, better design um, clinical trials. So there are a number of activities happening already within CEDAR that takes us in this direction, and, and I think we'll see those continue. The other thing I wanted to sort of say as it relates to moving this direction to be, be more patient-centric and refined, there are other activities happening on, on other areas of FDA, such as in the devices center, CDRH, that also provide inspiration. I often call the devices center the EBCOT of FDA. Um, if you've ever been to EBCOT at Disney World, it's the environmental prototype community, experimental prototype community of tomorrow, and you know, sort of provides a glimpse into what things might look like uh, in the future. And two examples that exist right now and provide sort of an inspirational regulatory glimpse of potential innovation in the future. One is um, simulated clinical trials that are being performed where simulated heart models are, are being used to evaluate heart catheterization devices, um, as an example. Another um, activity happening within the context of, of CDRH that I think is quite inspirational is looking towards new regulatory pilot programs, such as the pre-certification pilot to allow for new regulatory pathways for software as a medical device, which is gonna be, gonna be very important for personalization in the future. So those are some like trends that I think show us how things might move with respect to better drug development, better device development, but also the integration of, of mathematics and data, as you pointed out. Um, the second thing that I would say is something else that's near and dear to my heart, and I'd like to come back to um, in a few minutes when we talk about uh, the book of work of the FDA, because you sort of highlighted that um, there's the chance that so much working is coming to the FDA that the FDA becomes a choke point because there is so, so much complex work. And that's that we need the data and technical infrastructure that allows us to do the work such as simulation for clinical trials, allows us to do the work of understanding and using real world data, allows us to be more efficient, and also allows us as an agency to um, be able to work smarter and scale the work that we do so that um, as more and more regulatory work comes down the pipe, we're, we're able to accommodate it. The last thing um, that uh, you mentioned is, is sort of you asked about what is this, you, know, you sort of asked as it relates to value and cost and patient centricity, and you mentioned CMS there. And you know, a, a, as you know, at FDA, we don't have a responsibility as it relates specifically to cost and, and payment. Uh, that certainly was on the, the reimbursement side of the aisle with CMS. But a couple of things um, to highlight. Um, we have a book of, book of work emerging right now um, that I, I recently um, and started talking about between FDA and CMS, where we're looking to align some of the FDA requirements, for example, in the post-approval space um, at, uh, with some of the CMS requirements, sort of what used to be called, for example, coverage with evidence development, so that multi-purpose data sets can be used for both tasks simultaneously. And um, for a mitral valve um, device, this was um, a part of the coverage um, notification um, for the draft notice uh, not too long ago. And I think that was sort of the first example that you'll see of this move towards creating um, multi-purpose data sets and aligned work to be most efficient in the development of evidence and service of both FDA and CMS as we move towards optimization, efficiency, and also start, helps to support questions as it relates to value. And I think those are the kinds of examples that you'll see um, in the future. And then in terms of patient centricity, certainly there's been more um, integration of the patient voice all across the clinical development. And as an FDA, we've continued to do what we can to push that along. And I think that we're going to continue to see that, whether it's um, patient-informed drug development, 
or patient reported outcomes as clinical outcomes, or even, for example, the project that you're seeing happen in the Oncology Center for Excellence at FDA right now, where um, there are there is there's a website with patient reported information such as experience with fatigue and nausea um, directly available in patient facing. Um, ways for people to be able to understand that about the drugs that they're taking and also what's the exact information derived from clinical trials. And so those are the kinds of things I think that's going to be happening um, in, in the future. Lastly, but it's CMC, because uh, that sort of crept in here as we were, as we were talking. And, and certainly manufacturing, I think, is going to continue to be a major area of focus and a major area of also further innovation um, as we think about um, how do how do we better simulate model and, and improve understanding of um, manufacturing and how to optimize. Um, and also a fair amount of work is happening at FDA right now as it relates to advanced manufacturing. Um, certainly in the cell and gene therapy space, um, manufacturing certainly looks to be a really important uh, central component to, to moving that space forward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us worry about the CMC, particularly since a lot, much of it is done overseas. And as we move to do some of this in the United States, it could be an added hurdle. Uh, could we just take a minute and maybe talk about the preclinical side of this? Because is there is there support to move towards some kind of digital models that would either supplement or replace tox studies in animal models that would help us move forward some of these early developments? Uh, or kind of moving away from general animal and, and mice type models to digital AI models? So, um, you know, it, it's hard for me to give you the exact details of all of these um, areas of work because this is such an important area of, of focus for us. Um, but our, our Office of the Chief Scientist in particular right now has been working on um, developing a number of um, preclinical informed advanced sort of uh, in, in vitro simulation models. Um, certainly one area of focus for us has been um, reduction in the use of non-human primates. And so thinking about um, what uh, preclinical models um, we could look to to try and reduce um, that need. There's been evaluation of, for example, organs on a chip based systems and, and, and other approaches. And I, I think one of the things that as I've been listening to this conversation happening at FDA, and I really can't say exactly where that conversation is going, I've been struck um, by two aspects that I, I think are um, important for this community. One is that um, FDA does a lot of its own science. And when I first got to FDA, I was trying to understand that. Um, you know, so why do we have a 800 person office of the chief scientist with you know a, a large set of laboratories um why do we do science in every one of our our, our product centers and, and it's it, it, i see it as having a twofold task um one is that um it helps to fill in gaps of work that needs to be done within the context of for example understanding prenatal models or or, or, or uh, other areas and the second is it's, it helps to build essentially a cadre of experts across the agency who now know how to think about these new model systems, including their pitfalls and advantages, and be able to provide really expertise in, in thinking about it within the agency. That actually brings me to my second thing that I have learned um, since being at the agency, which is what I call familiarity. One of the important aspects of whether we're talking about preclinical models, real world data, or um, thinking about various types of simulations is that um, you know work that happens way over there and you might see um, in a 10 minute presentation or on a poster at a conference, it's hard to wrap your head around and decide whether or not you believe that this is um, reliable and credible enough to incorporate into high risk decision making, such as the de decisions we have to make at the FDA. So importantly, having FDA reviewers, having FDA internal experts see and participate in the kind of work that we're talking about helps to build the familiarity and the muscle to actually become more comfortable and confident in different solutions for the future. And I've seen that everywhere I've looked across the agency. 
Yeah. You know, that's a good point, a good bridge to a, a, a slightly different topic. But um, a lot of people don't realize that the FDA does have this uniqueness in developing its own um, own raw databases. And um, I mean, it is. A, I think we're the only the FDA is the only agency in the world that does have this these raw data, this, these raw databases. And this is powerful, and as are the various other databases from pharma, biotech, the academic centers, and as you pointed out, other elements of real-world data. How do you envision all these silos kind of working together, these multi-ontologies? You need a massive algorithm uh, to bring forward the clinical trial, lower to improve the clinical trial time and costs and ultimately patient outcomes and experience. Interesting question. So, you know, um, I'll, I'll start um, with what I'm going to call the basics. So uh, I came to FDA in February of 2019, really thinking that my areas of focus were going to be real-world data and patient-centered um, care, basically precision medicine. And um, went, whoa, 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 wait a second. If we're really going to move forward in the direction that you just described, our we have to make sure that the agency itself is modern in how we store and manage and use data in order to be able to advance that vision. Um, and so I took on the role of chief information officer in April of um, 2019 in order to move us down the path of both tech and data modernization. And we announced our technology modernization action plan um, almost a, a, exactly a year ago, really to make sure that we've got the right foundational infrastructure to be able to use data differently. Because in order for data not to be in silos, we have to take it out of individual databases sitting on people's hard drives and come up with common data infrastructure, ideally cloud-based infrastructure that's appropriate efficient and secure that allows us then to have more pooled integrated data sets. So the ability to now start to form data lakes, the ability to now to have common ontologies, et cetera. And so that has been a really big area of focus. I remember Mark McClellan said to me, so Amy, isn't it just about buying faster computers? And in fact, the technology modernization efforts at FDA have really been about rethinking how we store and manage data, how we use the cloud, how we think about security, but really how we do our work. That then led to our data modernization action plan. Um, and really 2020 was intended to be the year of data modernization for FDA. And I announced that at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. And the goal is really to rethink how we manage data, how we analyze data and the tasks to which we can put data to work. Um, and one example is, for example, at, at FDA, we are building machine learning algorithms to better predict um, which container to inspect at the border for food inspections looking for stinky fish. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the, the new ways of using data at FDA. I go back to your question, which is that, you know, FDA, we have our own data sets. We bring in data sets um, from across industry as well as across government and, and many, other, many other places. And then certainly we advise in the use of data. And our analysis of data, whether, whether it's in service of a specific re review and application, or if it's um, work that we're doing, whether in the research frame or, or in other ways, um, is, is part of, I think, one of the unique mus muscles of the agency and really allows us to be very thoughtful in our work. And also, as I said before, I think strong beacons of what does good look like with respect to high quality analyses and, and, and credible results. And I think that as we continue now to bring data together from multiple sources, we're going to start putting it to use in many different ways that really lead in service to what you've described. So some of those ways will be better clinical trial designs. Um, over, over time, I expect model-informed drug development to, to sort of move towards being really not just a preclinical and sort of early designs, but sort of a, you know, really simulations and improving trial design all across the process and being informed through data. We certainly are, are, are using data now, as I mentioned very early um, in, in our session, to um, really think differently about supporting and managing drug shortages 
and understanding the medical product supply chain. Um, certainly the PPE story in the United States um, was something that really has taught us how important it is that we, we use data differently. And we're thinking about how do we use data differently for many other tasks, whether that is identification of safety signals um, or you know, one of the things that I personally would love to see in the future is can you imagine personalized drug drug labels that allow the individual person to have a, a drug label that meets who they are, whether they have underlying diabetes or by age or, or, or other personal features um, based on what, what we understand about our drug and how it performs. And so I see a lot of different directions that this may go. Um, but first, we've got to get the infrastructure right. Right. So just along those lines, who's going to own the data? Who, you're going to have you're going to have a, and there's there's going to be a reluctance, right? Particularly with uh, you know we've historically been an open ecosystem for international collaboration. Then when you think of digital innovation increasing subject to restrictions on national security, where does that fall in the whole spectrum? But really, who's going to own the who who are going to own the, who's going to own the data? In the CRO world, we had that problem when we wanted to move forward with the identified data, right? And that, you know, so so first of all, it, it depends on the data set. And so one of the things that we're working on right now at FDA is a strong program in data governance um, that is a part of our data modernization efforts. And you know, certainly there is already you know critical work that happens in terms of understanding contractually who owns what and 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 and, and what data sets can be used for what purposes. Um, but um, I I anticipate that our data governance approaches will will fortify that and, and, and help us down this path. Um, you know, some data sets that are FDA generated are owned by FDA and the public, um, some of which we make available through Open FDA, which is a, um, a, a, a public facing mechanism to access um, FDA based data sets. Some data sets are proprietary for the particular sponsor or, or, or particular organization and need to be tagged and managed as, as such. Um, you know, I think that it's important that a, that a key part of how we think about our data management strategy incorporates key information about ownership so that data are used in service of the task for which they are legally and appropriately and contractually able to be used. But a lot of times people ask me this question also wondering what about patient data and when do patients own the data? And, and you know, I think that there's an ongoing public conversation that is really important here um, about patient data ownership and what that should look like now and into the future that, you know, really is not FDA's specific purview and is really our overall social contract with each other that we're going to need to continue. The last thing I will say is, Oh my, oh my, once we go past the borders, it does get more complex, whether we're talking about GDPR, you know, sort of thinking about international harmonization of different types. Um, and, uh, you know, that certainly is high in our mind, but we need to run before, we need to walk before we run. So, um, you know, I've really been thinking first about how do we, you know, ensure strong data governance um, with in our borders, and then how is what is that going to look like as we think about international data sets and harmonization? Got it. You know, one of the things you said earlier was around collaboration, and really over the last decade, there's been a profound positive shift in with the FDA's approach to transparency, predictability, reliability, and responsiveness. Uh, in fact, investing in the rare disease arena, I've been encouraged by FDA's collaborative approach in working with a drug sponsor, and I believe this approach has been key in bringing forward many of our scientific and medical advancements. Uh, you know, we all we all want this to continue and expand. Um, and as PDUFA seven is negotiated, which we're in the we just started, and we had next year, I guess we'll bring the, that to a close. However, an obvious worry in keeping this collaborative approach relates to what we were talking about a minute ago: the human and system resources that are needed to deal with the many new medicines, be they traditional, or as you pointed out, cell and gene therapy. Um, will you be able to secure the amount of, uh, they're giving me a notice for 10 minutes, okay. Uh, will you be able to secure the amount of resources you need to be able to do that? And will Padoof, do you think PADUFA 7 will, well, certainly will help, to, will, will move to address that to make sure we've got the right resources to move these forward. But what are your thoughts in that regard? 
So I think this is such a critical question. Um, and you know that we, we have certain authorities right now um, that uh, we are leveraging and we will um, importantly continue to leverage into the future, such as um, our ability to hire differently um, in order to get the expertise at FDA that we need. And this was part of the 21st Century Cures Act. And so Cures hiring is something that um, we have really started to accelerate um, over the course of this last year in particular and, and um, move forward. Um, the second thing I would say is that we are very aware of the importance of not only making sure that we bring the right expertise into the agency, but we have a variety of ways of working that allows us to tap into expertise in new ways um, as well. And whether that's through our CERCI programs, which are different kinds of grant making programs with universities or, or other activities, those are important ways for us to touch the expertise. The third thing I would say is that um, our tech modernization activities, when, you know, one of the other reasons I started all that art was because it was so clear to me that if we didn't use data and technology differently, we were going to be mired in paper forever. And um, you know, one of my practical examples is that um, one of the um, most recent use cases in our um, data and, and technology um, portfolio is bringing in seven and 15 day safety reports for INDs, now um, directly into the agency, bringing that as structured data using a machine interface. So an API to bring the data directly from the sponsor, the CRO to, to the agency. So that now it's structured data and can be rapidly analyzed as opposed to medical reviewers reviewing forms and trying to find signals by hand, which then now provides an efficiency both from the standpoint of identifying safety signals, as well as be, frees up medical reviewer time to do other things. So we need to really work towards identifying how do we allow people to do the work that they need to be doing and get rid of essentially manual tasks. And so that sort of automation across the agency has been key. But I do submit to you that um, as we think about the authorities needed going forward, continued um, attention to and innovation in how we make sure that we've got all, all the people at the agency and we've got not only the number of people, but the, the breadth of, of expertise needed is going to be critical and um, do encourage that to be a, a sort of continued uh, focus area for your negotiations. Yeah. Okay. So this brings me to my last question. Um, uh, what will, or what would you like the FDA to truly look like in five or 10 years? and what resources would be required to get there? You've mentioned elements of it, but define it a little bit more clearly. Yeah, so, you know, I, I thought a lot about this question after um, you mentioned that you were gonna ask it. And I've also been thinking about where we are in this moment in time, October, 2020, um, where we have seen um, incredible strides as we've just been talking about collaboration, urgency, and working quickly. We've seen strides in um, how we can start using real world data plus clinical trial information um, and how we can work together in collaborative public private partnerships for the future. However, I, I think that it's important that we step back and we ask the question, what's it going to take for there to be continued, what I call responsible progress, right? If we, if we move too fast without cross-checking to make sure that we're doing this in a responsible and credible way, there may be suspicion that um, we're doing this too much in service of a commercial interest as opposed to a patient or public health interest. And so we really need to make sure that we've created an agenda around responsible progress. And, and so I think that in order to do that as an agency, we need to sort of state a very clear agenda that ensures FDA can do its you know, day-to-day -day tasks as it relates to regulating um, products across all the spaces that we regulate, that it, we make sure that we're able to really focus on what's it gonna take to harness per personalization in service of public health, um, and that we are 
also continuously focused on this continuous improvement paradigm, like we talked about a few minutes, minutes ago, that um, really is continuously learning from our data and our experience to do better in, in, in a way that allows everybody to say, of course, that's the direction that we want to go. And one yeah. of the things that I've noticed, oh, go ahead. No, 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 good, please finish. Yeah, one of the things that I've noticed is that in order to do that, we actually have to have responsible continued use of data and technology to generate the evidence, to support rapid transfer of information, et cetera, and also to maintain the FDA is the gold standard. Um, I, I, I go through with such care saying all that, because again, as I say that, there is this piece I think that sort of says, of course, but there are a lot of concerns out there that that we we might not be moving in in such a con considered um and, and progressive way and so you know the things that we're going to need to do we're going to need to continue to explain the why in a very cred credible way we're going to need to continue to document the science and show how for example using a totality of the evidence-based approach does ensure that we are not lowering the evidence standard, but instead of maintaining the evidence standard, but still doing our work better and more efficiently. We need to make sure that we show that the work that we're doing is actually more inclusive, right? One of the things that's interesting about totality of the evidence is it allows us to understand all patients. And so showing that this is about being inclusive is I think one of the ways that, that will um, allow us to move forward. And then we also need to be able to think about the fact that when we have personalized drugs and therapies, we often are only studying small populations, right, in the, in, in the original um, approvals. And so we're gonna need to be able to have capabilities that allow us to longitudinally monitor across time and that you know support our FDA's authority in that post-approval space to continue to support that kind of longitudinal evaluation um, that's needed. I also sort of mentioned something a few minutes ago around moving towards multi-purpose data sets and the ability to use them, for example, for multiple tasks so that we can align efficiency across FDA and payers CMS and other payers. So we're able to do the work that we need to do in this space um, in, in as efficient way as possible. Some of the things that we're gonna need, we really need to focus on the information architecture. I mean, that's probably my lens anyway, but it's yeah. really cl clear that this is um, what's needed. We're gonna need some policy directions, um, some around real world evidence and, and in totality of the evidence. Um, some, I, I think around how do we use real world data to support personalization, such as longitudinal evaluation for personalized therapy and um, clinical decision support so doctors know what to do. Um, we, you talked about data privacy and governance. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, we, we talked about some of the scientific development that needs to happen. But the last thing I would say here, Art, is it really needs leadership leadership at FDA and also across industry that describes a cohesive vision and strategy and says this is where we need to keep moving and this is how it fits together and why it's in service of patients and public health. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, as we go into the next five to 10 years, that's going to be a really important narrative for us to push forward. Yeah, no, good, good summary. And thank you. Thank you, Amy. I do think a lot of this will be addressed even further as we go through PDUFA 7 and the discussions we have there, because it'll touch on some of those points. Thank you again. Sarah, over to you. Hey, thank you both. Thank you both, Amy. So this concludes the formal portion of uh, our discussion with, uh, with Amy and Art. Uh, for those of you ha who have to leave, you'll be prompted to take a very brief uh, survey. Um, and um, for those of you who do have to leave, I do again want to thank all of our sponsors. As many of you know, when you do events like this, our sponsors are critically important to, uh, to um, making it all happen. And now we'll move into the live uh, Q&A session. So we've had a number of questions that have kind of come in here, Amy, and some of them are all over the place. Um, let me ask you one that may be easy for you to answer, and if you can't answer it, you can't answer it. What do you think about the future of life science startups in New York City, considering you're with Flatiron? <laughs> 
So I can't comment on Flatiron, but I can I'm comment on the startups in, in New York City. <laughs> so I can I can comment on the general the general category. And you know, I think New York City is a terrific place for life sciences startups, um, both because uh, you know there's been the development of the kind of you know, sort of hotbed of activity that allows the interactions um, to, you know, create the creative innovation that needs to happen. You're close to the New Jersey corridor, so that that's a sort of a helpful feature as well. And I, I think the other thing that New York has is a strong health tech focus, which um, also provides a unique lens for sort of life lens as startups. Yeah, I can't believe I can't believe what the the activity you know that is focused here, especially when you consider what's going on in the on the digital side that crosses over into into uh, drug development. I have another question um, that has to do with uh, telemedicine, mm -hmm. and in one of our last discussions, last salons that we had, we talked about. You know, the, you know, the fact that there are so many people who don't have access, you know, easily to medical care and certainly the rise of telemedicine, which has become widely becoming more widely accepted now, has made a big difference in, in their lives. And, uh, you know, so this question is, do you see telemedicine continuing? Will it be easier? Will doctors be able to get reimbursed uh, for a virtual uh, uh, visit? And then what happens, you know, when um, uh, as, as we extend telemedicine and virtual visit to having, you know, in, you know, sensors for people so that a doctor can actually evaluate them? Yeah, so really um, important and interesting question. As you know, I learned not too long ago that like the first telemedicine visit was um, in the late 1800s um, when uh, somebody... Well, there, were no I think, there were no telephones in the late 1800s. <laughs> right? so, I mean... <laughs> Like the transmission of something that had to do with an ECG, it was very interesting. But um, uh -huh. the, the the you know, as I think about the current uh, persistence of telemedicine, uh, you know what what COVID has taught us is really what's possible and what can this look like. It's created a level of comfort. Yeah. We've talked many times in the last hour about this concept of familiarity, right? Familiarity is so important because you can start to say, "Ah, I know what that looks like," and I can see why this interaction will still keep me safe. And so I, I think that the, the familiarity of telemedicine has been very important. I, I think it's going to persist not only in the context of clinical trials, but in the context of routine everyday health. Although there are aspects of telemedicine that um, might not, uh, there are aspects that, that may still lead many people to continue to go to their doctor for a variety of reasons, whether that's because they feel safer in that space or um, the, the human contact. I know that certainly Zoom life um, has created a, a big question around human contact for all of us. Yeah. But you have an interesting and important question, which is that we often think about telemedicine as that screen plus me. But it's actually now becoming a more holistic set of activities. It's the pulse ox and being out. My mom this morning showing her finger with her pulse ox to me um, by by FaceTime as I was talking to her, or it is um, the ability to have a variety of sensors that you've incorporated into your everyday life through um, a watch that's much more than a watch that now uh, accumulates key information either to your doctor or your clinical study nurse or something else. And I think those kinds of innovations are going to persist. Um, a lot of the changes right now, not only in terms of the telecapabilities, but also in the licensing activities and the reimbursement activities, I think are going to be part of what creates this persistent culture. Yeah, and when you mention uh, sensors, uh, as we were planning for BioFuture, I reached out to um, a, a fellow who works for a German automotive company. And this German automotive company, I won't mention the name, is developing um, you know, cars that will have sen sensors in them that will totally report on your health to your physician. You know, this is coming in the future. And Elon Musk is not involved in that. At this point. <laughs> so um, another question for you. you know, Amy, I mean, Sarah, before you jump off, you mentioned the, the payer part's an important part of the telemedicine. 
and trend. clearly and clearly it's being endorsed appropriately you know johns hopkins had its original tele telemedicine telemedical program i guess it was where they were dealing with international markets and a physician could do work and and that could be observed by a physician at johns hopkins and the the difficult part that they had they were early entries in the 19 early 19 early i guess it was 19 in 1985 or 90 where they had it was really getting reimbursed for all that the acceptance was easy but reimbursement was the challenge but i think that has changed at least that's what we're hearing i very true oh i was just saying that that's very true and i think you know it goes i mean similar to what we've talked about with drugs like it goes back to access and and reimbursement is has to be a part of the equation or something doesn't really have uptake and persist yeah okay yeah i think more i think you know to the um to the extent that people are becoming much more familiar and comfortable with zoom i think i think it will like we think the virtual salons are now here to stay because you know at first we were afraid of them uh how can we convert our business to a yeah. virtual business this way and now it's it's uh, it's it's really become a very important communications tool for us the challenge, the challenge and the benefit will be our rural areas yeah that's that that, when i'm when i think uh you know the question came in uh uh you know regarding telemedicine it's thinking about those areas where hospitals are two or three hours away or yeah. doctors or you know maybe one per you know ten thousand people uh, over you know many many hundreds of miles um here's another question um uh, and this has to do with gathering clinical trial data and um, gathering it across the globe. Uh, do you anticipate that that will start to happen? Uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and are there countries uh, that would not allow this type of data to be gathered electronically? Well, it's already gathered it's already being gathered. Uh, just take the CRO world working with a drug sponsor. They have data from all over the world. And that's part of the problem and the challenge. Um, how can it be used, even if it's de-identified? In the United States, and correct me here, Amy, today most patients are just opt out of providing their data. Otherwise, they provide it. So in the future, it may be de-identified and available, but it's gathered already, correct, Amy? Yeah, yeah. In this case, a, a correction, a correction. I just want to make sure this is remote clinical data. So similar to what we're doing now, um, as companies have had to go to remote, gathering information remotely. Still going into the data set, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just did a panel yesterday with um, a researcher in the EU that's looking at the implications across multiple countries um, in the EU right now for decentralized clinical trials and remote patient monitoring. And so um, I think that you know what I what I took out of that conversation yesterday is that it's going to be important for us to do the detailed work of exactly what needs to happen country by country in order to make sure that information that's being captured, for example, within electronic health records, um, with, through remote visits and clinical trials, and, and through a variety of different solutions, um, uh, is done in a way that meets the expectations and laws of each of the individual locales. Um, and I, I think that work is going to continue. They, they were just kicking this off um, as the project from the EU yesterday that we were talking about. Okay. Okay, here's a technical, somewhat of a technical question. Um, uh, you know, with the experience of virtual advisory committee meetings, um, uh, will, will that change the way ad comms are conducted once in-person meetings return? It's a great question. And I think that, you know, this is an important area for um, all of us to stop and take stock of what's working and what's not. Um, and so I really can't say what's really going to happen here yet, but I, I do think it is in line with FDA's commitment to look all across um, the agency and ask um, which changes 
that have happened within the context of COVID should persist and why. And, and we've learned we've learned all kinds of interesting things um, just about how we work um, through COVID. And I expect that there'll be um, really important answers coming from that kind of work. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, here's a here's a, another question. Um, what is the likelihood that COVID-19 treatment and vaccines will ultimately depend upon a, a personalized medicine approach to reach the most vulnerable populations? Oh, so what's the likelihood that COVID-19 vaccines and, and, and treatments um, are gonna require a personalized medicine approach? You know, I, I think that right now, none of us know how this COVID story is, in, is going to end, right? This is the story that's still being told. Um, I think that what we're seeing unfold right now is that um, there is likely going to be a variety of different therapies developed that have differing roles depending on whether or not you're developing challenges with blood clotting, um, are you early in illness, have you required oxygen? So as, you, as we think about these different features and we know the timing of where different treatments have a role in the overall COVID experience and story, I think that we'll start to fit treatments together um, mm -hmm. in that way. And, and so that is, in my mind, one part of that personalization story. And then, you know, the other thing that you highlighted is, is in the area of vaccines, is very, vaccines get, get developed, which vaccines um, you know, have specific roles for different populations, whether that is um, the older person or a person with, for example, lupus or other, uh, other underlying illness. And, and so, you know, I, I think these are the kinds of questions that we really have to get our head around. And is the reason why, even when something gets approved, whether through EUA or full approval, um, it's going to be important to continue to collect the information about how the product is being used what the safety profile and how it's working, because we really need to continue this refinement. But I do think that we're moving towards having sort of essentially more of a cocktail personalized approach. Okay, thank you. So here's, here's another question. Uh, uh, how do you regulate digital health? Hmm. Such an interesting question. So, uh, you know, the the first thing about digital health is digital health is a very broad category, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, the regulation of di digital health currently looks different by type of product and intended use. And, and that's similar to um, a, a lot of the products that we regulate. Um, but let me kind of hit on one that I suspect is motivating this question, which is that um, within the digital health space, especially um, software-based products, there is the opportunity for innovation to happen and those products to have continuous update cycles, right? Either because um, they're software-based algorithms that, that can continuously update and learn, or they're products that, that have you know, software um, cycles that, that are, are, are frequent development cycles. And so you know, I think that it's required of us to step back and say, how might we need to um, plan the regulatory process in a way that doesn't slow down that innovation, but still make sure that things don't go off the rails. And um, you know, there is a pilot program going on right now called the pre-certification program that basically is um, acting as a pilot regulatory um, pathway that happens in line with the traditional device pathway and um, allows for several critical elements in software development to be evaluated and potentially then become a new uh, paradigm for regulation of these products. That includes evaluation of the company and how they develop their software. So they have, do they have appropriate um, good software development um, practices in place. Um, it includes um, the product and its, its performance, but also very importantly, improve, includes the mechanism for continuously evaluating the performance of the product being used in real world settings across time. So that pre-certification program um, is, is a pilot. It's still being evaluated. It gives me a sense 
of the kind of innovation, innovative regulatory pathways you're going to be need, needed in the um, digital health space, and I think that you'll start to see more of. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw them muting me. It's we're getting to our last question. So, <laughs> um, and and this one may be um, a little bit broad. Um, so this questioner asks uh, that they'd like to get your take on how we'll enable a safe and reliable collection of data from a converging worlds so that we can better inform diagnosis, drug development, care and outcomes measurements. And who in your view should own that data? Hopefully we could that a bit. <laughs> that's a big one. Uh, that's a big one. Um, you know, th this, this kind of concept of being able to really um, ultimately start to merge information coming from all of these different sources and worlds has been um, really a, a focus of my research and, and an activity for the last 15, 20 years. I think it was actually really the conversation Art and I were having that, um, that evening uh, that he mentioned at the beginning of the salon today. Um, that's where we started. And, you know, I think that what we're starting to learn already right now is how do we merge and link data sets and put them to different types of uses? Um, how do we merge clinical trials and real world data sets that come from electronic health records? How do we merge different types of real world data sets, such as information from Twitter and social listening data um, together with claim data and, and, and electronic health record data to create a richer story. So I, I see all those activities starting to happen. One of the things that we talked about earlier in this hour was this idea of data being then put to multiple purposes, because as you have larger repositories of data, you can now take those data sets and put them to multiple tasks. So we've described, for example, using the same data to address a post-marketing question for FDA and a coverage with evidence development question for CMS simultaneously. And I think that that's that kind of issue that the, the questioner brought up as, as it relates to using data simultaneously for clinical drug development, for example, as well as healthcare delivery um, and making better choices um, at uh, the bedside. Um, that process is going to take a lot of practice, and I don't think it's going to happen very quickly. But that's really, um, I think, the direction that we're going. It's going to take really foundational infrastructure and architecture as it relates to better data use. The last part of the question is about who owns it. And man, oh man, I think this is really important. Um, data governance, ownership, feeling confident is going to be a really important part. Essentially, it's the trust fabric, right? And I think this is gonna require a public conversation. It's gonna require the right kinds of contractual elements. Um, and it's gonna require uh, the derived value from all participants in the system. Okay, thank you. They're signaling to me. It's, it, uh, they keep putting me on mute. So, <laughs> so, so Amy, thank you so very much. There are more questions, but out of respect for your time, I think we've covered quite a, quite a broad swath in our discussion uh, this morning. And Art, uh, thank you so much as well for leading the discussion uh, with Amy. Um, I'd like to thank you both for, for joining us. I'd like to thank everybody who is in our audience for joining us today. As you depart, uh, you will there will be a survey, as I noted before, uh, for, uh, and, and please do take a moment or two to answer the, the few questions that we have. And finally, I do want to say uh, again, once again, thank you to all of our sponsors for BioFuture who are supporting us as we uh, continue with our, uh, our um, uh, virtual salon series. And join us for our next salon, uh, which is bioelectronic, uh, bioelectronic Medicine, Sparking Innovation in Healthcare, uh, which will take place on October 28th. With that, thank you both. Thank you both thank for joining you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Take Thanks. care. Thanks. Great to see you guys. Bye. Good luck with your mom.